Okay, Matt, I have a very strange question for you. I'm all kinds of excited. And I'm going to follow this with a story. So I don't answer the question. Well, you can choose, well, react to the question first. Like with my face? Just how, however you want to react to it. Okay. okay. The question is, what is the most memorable sandwich you've ever eaten? Okay. <laughs> okay. This is this on the surface this seems like a dumb question. This is not a dumb question. Okay, I figuratively I received a knuckle one of those in 8th grade and it was very memorable. That's the that's the only one of those that I've ever taken just right in the kisser. The old knuckle sandwich did not enjoy it. Yeah. In terms of a literal sandwich Okay, I got it. You want me to say? Um, yeah. How about let me tell this my story first, and then maybe it'll trigger something in your mind about your memorable sandwich. Yes, yes, a literal sandwich. Yeah, there, there's a there's a comedy skit on the internet. Oh, I've heard ha- of it. Have you seen this sand this this thing about Seymour and the sandwich? No. Seymour, I made you a sandwich. (laughs) Have you seen this? this? No, you're acting like I should know. It's a really good skit. Just look up Seymour, I made you a sandwich. He's about two friends, and they're sitting there, and one guy makes another guy a sandwich. He goes, hey, Seymour, I made you a sandwich. He goes, what? You made me a sandwich? He's like, yeah, man, I made you a sandwich. He's like, that's for me? And he eats it, and it's like this really good bro moment. It's it's fantastic. You have to watch it. (laughs) Okay. But... um. There's something that happens in my mind when I eat at a certain location. It's it's like a, a memory is hard coded in my mind. And I, I want to tell you a story about a sandwich I ate in Farafini, the Gambia. Oh, the Gambia you may know is the, pretty much like the smallest country in Africa. I don't know. Lesotho. With your hand, you're making a horizontal sliver so as to indicate that it is on the extreme west coast of Africa, as opposed to a vertical sliver which would indicate like Togo or Benin on the southern side. Right. So the Gambia, if you were to look at Africa and imagine that it is a Tyrannosaurus Rex head. Oh. oh, Facing left. Hey. You've got Senegal and you have Senegal in like there's the Gambia River and it's facing left towards the Atlantic Ocean. And so the tongue of Senegal would be the Gambia. It's, It's a very small horizontal country. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went there. So several years ago, my sister went to Sierra Leone. Okay, she was a Peace Corps volunteer. She was a, a member of the first Peace Corps volunteer group that went back after the Civil War in Sierra Leone. And this was a, a really big deal because the America was back. Right, we're we're back to do diplomatic stuff and to help people. And so at the same time, my buddy Stevo was in the Gambia, in the Peace Corps. Hmm. So I got to thinking about it, and I was like, you know, I can do a two-for-one visit special. I can go to Senegal, I could fly into Dakar, and then I can go uh, I can go down to the Gambia, Farafini, and uh, the, the main capital in the Gambia is called Banjul. So I go to Banjul and then travel overland to Farafini, visit Stevo, hang out there for a while, about a week, and then travel um, back to Banjul, and then go... Actually, I didn't fly into Banjul. I took a, a taxi, a motor taxi, from Dakar down to Banjul, and then we went to Farapini. And then from there, went down to Sierra Leone to visit my sister. So this is a pretty big trip yeah. b- back in the day. I had, two, I think, two children at the time, and uh, so it was a big deal. Like, Tough saying goodbye at the airport. It was. It, it was such bit, a big yeah. deal that I recorded messages to my children on video in the event that I didn't, didn't come back. You know, I wasn't wow. I wasn't scared, but I was like, I just need to be smart about this because I'm traveling overland in an area that I know nothing about. They just finished the Civil War. My sister's there. It's probably cool. I don't know, right? So anyway, when you travel in a place like this, there's a lot you don't know. There's a whole lot you don't know. For example, when I got to Dakar, I did not know how to get to where I needed to go. Like, I did not know 
where to go, and there were no addresses. Like, if you want to navigate into Car, Senegal, it's it's like a huge country. Unemployment's very, very high. I got there right before sundown, and I'm on foot. So I got to figure that out. Very interesting, right? Wow. Yeah, so anyway, um, long story short, all... Wait, no, no, let's go long story long. Did you have to stay somewhere you didn't expect to? Kindness of strangers? How did you get where you're going? I'm trying to remember which time I was alone and which time I was with Steve-O. So Steve-O was there one of the times. I don't know if he met me at the airport in Dakar when I landed or if I flew back, if I went back and then left. I don't remember. One time I was alone, one time I wasn't. There was a person that worked for the United States Embassy in Senegal, and I had to navigate to their house. Okay, I remember now. So Steve-O met me when I landed. And when I went back the second time, he wasn't with me or something like that. And so I had to just walk on foot, and I had a single phone number to this individual that I, I, I don't remember his name. I think it was John. And I just called him on the phone. I was like, hey, man, you know, how do I get to you? He's like, well, um, well, go this way, and you're going to see this little plastic ice cream cone outside of a shop and turn left there. I was like, what's the street name? And he laughed at me. He's like, there's no street names here. Wow. So I start walking, <laughs> you know, ethnically, I'm very different from everyone else around. And so I'm a target because I'm wearing a bright blue backpack, you know, everybody wants to give me a ride. And so I say, no, no, thank you. Don't want a ride. And so I, I go up and I find the only taxi driver that doesn't want to give me a ride. I say, hey, man, will you give me a ride to this location? And I had a like general area of the city. He's like, sure. And I, I hop in and at some point. I start take, noticing he's taking some, some weird back roads, and I just hop out of the taxi. I paid him, hop out of the taxi. It was just weird to socially navigate. Mostly speaking French, a little bit of wall-off in there, I believe. Anyway, long story short, I did some things right, I did some things wrong. You did that right. I've got a friend who's got a treacherous story of picking the wrong cab driver somewhere and being driven straight into a... An abduction. Really? Uh, yep. I got flagged down into an area. Looked like maybe the driver was in on it. And pull around off a ramp behind a thing, out of sight from everybody. And second he realized what was going on, grabbed the wheel, fought for control of the vehicle, and drove out. Bailed? And, and no, took control of the vehicle and drove out with the vehicle, like battling for control of the taxi. Really? To get back to where they were in plain view of traffic. Yes. And that solved the problem. The people with the weapons just dissipated Went into away. the neighborhood. Yeah. You have to make really quick decisions, and they matter. They really, really matter. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, all that to say, I was not acclimated to that social environment. Steve-O, Reagan, my sister, no problems. Okay. They're all over it. I, I remember after we went to the Gambia and we showed up in Sierra Leone, I remember... Um, my dad had sent me $600 to give to my sister. Which is still a lot of money. That's a lot of money. dang, that was a lot of money then, I bet. Yeah, it was a lot of money. And it was cash. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I'll never forget this, dude. So I'm thinking, when I arrive in Freetown, Sierra Leone, that I'm going to show up. Man, we're, we are going to talk about sandwiches, I promise. I'm excited to talk about sandwiches. Yeah. I, so I asked for this. When I showed up in Freetown, I was expecting, oh, I'm the big brother and I'm going to show up with $600, and you know I'm here to check on my sister for my mom and my dad. In my mind, they'd never said anything like that. And so I'm just going to like visit her, let her know she's loved, all this stuff. And I, I kind of imagined her as this person that was like supported by this big system, and and she's in the system or whatever. I showed up, and it could not have been further from the truth. I took the ferry from the airport across to uh, Freetown. There, there's a there's a little, it's weird. You, you get it's up. Separated by water? Yes. You get on a ferry. Steve-O and I show up to meet my sister, and we're just supposed to meet in the circle. She's like, yeah, when you get off the ferry, I'll be in the circle. I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopping out of the ferry. I'm walking around. I'm like, she's got to be here somewhere. She's going to be easy to spot at least, right? And so I see her, and I'm expecting a hug. Like, oh, thank you so much for visiting me. And... I can't remember if she had a cigarette in her mouth or not, but what I do know is the feeling was like, you know, instead of this heart, you know, I haven't seen you in a year and a half. How are you? I love you so much. You know, dad sent me. 
Imagine like you walk up to a cowboy and he like takes the last drag of a cigarette, throws it on the ground, stumps it out, and looks at you and goes, "Did you bring the money?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Uh, yeah, cool. Don't take it out here. Follow me." And I'm like, "What?" Okay. <laughs> and I teared up a little bit because I had this image of my my sister being not helpless, but like you know, it's my little sister, right? You teared up because of her strength, or you teared up because her she sh- wasn't nice to you. Her strength and command of the situation. Huh. Because she said, you got the money? Follow me. And she she turned around and she's walking and there's like a bunch of people there because they know she's with the Peace Corps. They're trying to figure out how to get money out of her. And she, she looks at somebody and she goes, you, I need a money changer. He goes, what? She goes, what price for, to change money? And it's a guy with like an apron and he changes money mm-hmm. to tourists or whoever mm-hmm. lands. She says, what's your price? Except she's speaking in Creole, like the language, the local language, which is like this weird pidgin English. What's your price? And she said, and he gave her a number in the language I didn't understand. She said, nope. She pointed at somebody else, said, what's your price? And he said, "Uh, this. And she said, nope. And then she found somebody. She's like, yes. And she says, follow me. So we still haven't said hello. And uh, I'm following her. We walk and... She walks in a restaurant, a random restaurant, and it's like a person's house with like a couple of tables in it. And she walks in and she goes, how much to rent the restaurant for a few minutes? And what? yeah, and, and they're like, uh, this price. She's like, great, block the door, something like that. And we sit down. And I was like, what's going on? She's like, I know this is weird. We just have to do this right now. And so people are at the door waiting on her. And she says, you, come here. And so what I'm realizing is she's using a power that I did not understand in the culture. She was like commanding people around in a positive way. She was supporting them, but they were there to support her because she, they knew that she was here to teach. And I don't know. It's really weird. She had this foreign power in the situation. It was strange. Very, very strange. So a guy comes in and she says, okay, so, you said that's your price, right? He goes, yeah, I'm sorry. This is my price now. She said, nope, go away. Someone else. She brought another person in and said, is this your price? She said, yep. I said, okay, cool. Let's count it out. She pulls, she says, hand me the money. I pull off the money. She brings it out. She counts it out. Like smoke filled back room is what this feels like, right? Counts it out. They count out the, uh, I think it's called Leones. 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 I think that was the local currency. I don't know. All right. Make it happen. They do the deal. And she gives him a cut, like the the money changing fee. Mm-hmm. And then she goes, she goes, okay, last thing, we've got to get to my village. She looks at someone, she goes, I need a car to take these three people, me, these two people, and then we need to go to this location. It's a little village called Mano. We need, we need a car to get to this location. She makes it all happen. And it's like crazy. It's I- insane. But I was kind of blown away by how much she was in control of the situation. And in a place that felt completely out of control to yes. you. Yes. I had imagined myself to be like this person that was going to help her and all this, and I was nothing. I was weak. I was in the way. I was a thing to be moved from one place to another. You were a danger to yourself yeah. and <laughs> yeah. others. Yeah, exactly. So you know what it's like to travel in these these situations. You've spent a lot of time in Africa, right? Yeah. you spent a lot of time in other places. Yeah. So, you know that feeling of, not helplessness, but like, I'm not in complete control here. Yes. We have a rule with my family when we travel. Make mistakes, that's fine, but do not bumble. We are here for a reason. We know why we are here. I may at times walk us to something that doesn't make sense just to put off the vibe that we know where we're going, and then we'll decide when we get there. Do not ask me where we are going. Do not ask me why we are walking in this direction. Simply follow my lead and match my body language. Right. And the idea is that I want to, I'm willing to take my family to weird places, real weird places, places tourists don't go. But there's a way you got to present yourself in those situations. And so I feel exactly like you felt. I just hide it and I'm ineffective and mask it until I can try to figure out what I'm doing. But when you drop into one of those situations, I've been to places where if I approached money changers like that, that would have worked. Like, I don't know you. I don't know your culture, but I can get by in this language. You, how much? No. You, I, 
I wouldn't do it, but I could imagine it working. I can imagine other places where if I pulled out that routine, nobody would change money with me. And word would circulate in 10 seconds that this guy is an outsider, height of rudeness. That doesn't work everywhere. You have to know. You can't just guess. You can burn your bridge with the entire underground network, the whole business network in a place within minutes of getting off the plane if you don't know. So you can't just walk in and do what she did. That was a result of attentiveness and research and far more than just my, we do not bumble, we do not run into each other, we do not slump, we are eyes up, we look like we know what we're doing, we're going to fake it until we make it routine. Because <laughs> even if we're faking it until we make it, we have not made it and we don't actually know what we're doing. We're just trying to look like it. Your sister, I mean, she's like Charlize Theron in that last Mad Max movie with the, like the stump arm and she's driving those vehicles and in command of everybody and is like emerged from the apocalypse and <laughs> puts out the cigarette and knows how all the things are. It's amazing. Dude, it was crazy. And what was really crazy is it was happening in a language I didn't know. And that the last time I met her, she didn't know. <laughs> how about that? It was wild. So, so you cried? I teared up. I didn't cry. You didn't say that when I asked you what the last time was that you cried. I don't remember. I asked you that once, and I think you went to something earlier than that. When I hit my dog? <laughs> I think that's what you went with. Okay, going back to sandwich. Yeah, we're not going to talk about dogs again. All right, so here's the deal. So that's what it looks like when you're kind of in a foreign place. You don't know what's going on. Somebody local has control of the situation, yes. but it's chaotic. So this is, this is Sierra Leone, but the sandwich wasn't in Sierra Leone. No, the sandwich that was the most memorable sandwich I've ever had was in the Gambia. Gambia. Fair Finney. So one week earlier... Um, when I was with Steve-O in Farafini, the Gambia, I woke up and I was starving. I was sleeping in a hammock. You know, I didn't think to bring granola bars or anything like that. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in it. Let's, I'm eating whatever's here. I woke up and I said, Steve-O, I know this is weird. I'm really, really, really hungry. Is there anywhere we can buy anything? Like, I know we had a lot of rice for dinner last night, but it, I don't know. It didn't touch it. I'm starving. It's like, yeah, we can uh, we can go get a sandwich. You want an egg sandwich? It's like, yeah, yeah, that sounds like breakfast. An egg sandwich sure. sounds amazing. He's like, okay, uh, go ahead and get ready. You know, get all your stuff together. I'm gonna go shower out back, and uh, we'll we'll go get an egg sandwich. I said, wonderful. So we went into Farafini on foot. It's it's an interesting town because Muslims and Christians live together. And the way you can, the, the line of demarcation is where the pigs run. So interesting. The Christians will have pigs, the Muslims will not have pigs. And so you can tell kind of what area of town you're walking through based on, you know, if, if you've got bovines or whatever you, you know, it just, it just depends. What is a pig? A pig is not a bovine. A pig is. Pig. <laughs> vine. I, I don't know. Whatever. It's, <laughs> it's fascinating. So. Culturally, I'm taking it all in. Very, very interesting. I'm interested in the sandwich. Oh, by the way, there's no electricity. I have not seen electricity since I've been there. I've seen some like wind-up radios. Wow. I haven't seen electricity. How is this sandwich going to happen? Hmm. So we walk into town. We can start to see the normal market things starting to appear on the sides. You know, you person selling fruit over here. We've got some water. Oh, wow. There's, there's some drinks that are refrigerated. Don't know how they're doing that. Interesting. Steve-O explained that once we got in closer to town, they had electricity, but it only works every so often. They have a hard time keeping the electric plant nearby running. Yeah, I've been around that. Yeah, so there's a table. I see a, a small table and a man sitting on a five-gallon bucket. And he's sitting at this table, and there's a bunch of cups on the table. Now, not like drinking cups. There's like a coffee mug you would get at a thrift store from the 80s. Like, you know, imagine those little... Sumter County, whatever, <laughs> right, square okay. dancing uh, sure. festival, you know, just whatever stuff is thrown out, there's a bunch of stuff on the table. He's got a spoon, he's got a mug, and to his left, below, uh, to his left, he's got like a, a plastic bag of bread, and to his right, he's got some kind of box or something like that. Steve-O walks up, and he says, all right, you want a sandwich? I say, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, all right, take a seat. So I sit down on, I forget what it was, some kind of stump or something. And uh, he says, in Mandinka, which is the local language, he's like, I can only imagine, he said, two egg sandwiches, please. 
But the, the interesting thing about the language there is you have to greet people. When you get there, you're like, how are you? How is the family? Tell me about your people. And, and you, have to, you have to have this exchange. And then once you do the exchange, then you can get down to business. And I'm assuming he said, two egg sandwiches, please. And he looks at me and is like, you know, everything on it? I was like, yeah, whatever, however they make it. I just want the local egg sandwich. He's like, cool. And then all the people that are around this table, they're talking, and they're having a very interesting conversation that I cannot participate in at all. There's a little bit of laughing, but this man proceeds to reach down, and he, he grabs something out of the box to his right. It's an egg. He cracks the egg. He grabs a coffee cup, and he puts the egg in the coffee cup. And he's got a pan of some sort over a little flame, and he reaches up, and he he, he lights the flame. That's a really good flame lighting sound, by the way. <laughs> that was your first try. Reaches down, gets some oil, splashes some oil in there. The pan seems to be still hot. He must have been saving the fuel, right? So he gets that, that oil nice and hot, and he pulls out a fork, and he starts mixing the egg in the mug. And the sounds, you know the tinking sounds that a spoon makes when you're mixing coffee? Sure. So tink, 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 he's making those sounds as he's mixing the egg, and then he, he pours the egg into the frying pan. He starts frying it, and I'm watching, and there's smells, and there's sounds, and it's hot. Like the the sun is beating down on me, and I'm starting to sweat. What the heck? It's only like you know 9 a.m. Why is it so hot all of a sudden? Why is everything so dry? You know, I'm thirsty, but he's making this egg. And he starts frying it up, and he's get some other kind of utensil that I don't remember, and he starts whopping it around and, like, you know, scrambling the egg. There's a lot of oil on this egg for some reason, whatever. And so he gets done, he reaches down, and he grabs a, a roll. It's like a stale, um, it, it's like a hoagie, but okay. it's a little more stale and less flavor, right? He gets out a knife. It's an old kitchen knife that hasn't been, you know, it, it's just a bad-looking kitchen knife. I remember the flies all over the place. He cuts the roll, and he takes the egg, and he scoops it up, and he puts it in the in the hoagie. And then uh, Steve-O looks at me after they say something. He's like, you want, you want some mayonnaise on it? And I was like, uh, just however you guys have it, man. Whatever you guys do, that's what I want. He's like, okay. And then man stands up. It's like 90 degrees outside. The five-gallon bucket that he's sitting on, he takes the, the lid out. It's underneath him almost like a toilet. He he kind of like stands up, takes the lid off, takes a, like that same knife, reaches down in that five-gallon bucket, <laughs> a big dollop of mayonnaise, <laughs> not refrigerated at all. No, no, even even warmed by his undercarriage. And, and then spreads that on the bread. Oh, no. Gets a piece of paper. I can't remember if it was a white paper or brown paper, and wraps it up real tight and then just hands it to me. And I look at it, and I was like, all these things were happening in my head. I was like, I didn't know you could do that with mayonnaise. Like, I thought mayonnaise... Wait, can you do that with mayonnaise? I didn't know. Right. I had no idea. I was like, what is the deal with mayonnaise? Can Does it have to be refrigerated? Like, it feels like, it feels like mayonnaise is important to refrigerate. Because I've seen it when I used to work at Dairy Queen. If we left it out too long, it would go from that white consistency to, like, clear like a yellowy clear color. Hmm. I didn't know, but I had mayonnaise on my egg sandwich. I was in Farrafini and I was starving. I said, thank you very much. I gave the man his coins and I ate it. And it was one of the most memorable sandwich experiences I've ever had in my entire yeah. life. I, I noticed you didn't lead with most delicious. No. Because it wasn't that. No. It was like that meal that Tara missed on. That you took seconds on because of your dad's advice. The sloppy Joe, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a sloppy Joe. That's yeah, what it was. Yeah, it was. It was yeah, a... it was not the best sandwich you've ever had, but that was also a memorable sandwich. It was a very memorable sandwich. Yeah. Well, I, that was multiple sandwiches. So that you got this egg sandwich in Farafini, and I think about it all the time, Matt. I. I what do you think about it? What does it conjure? I don't know, but I know I'm not alone in this. I'm, I know for a fact that I am not alone in thinking about a particular culinary moment in my life. Mm -hmm. Before I share something else with you, I received an email from somebody about this. I want to read the email to you. All uh, right, I'm ready. Do, do, would you like to 
tell me about any sandwiches that were very memorable to you? <laughs> I feel like you're asking me for a confession. Is there anything you'd like to say <laughs> to me now, Matthew? <laughs> so I'm guessing not. Uh, I've had a couple of very interesting meals in very interesting places, some for good reasons, some for weird reasons. I'm not talking about meals. I'm talking about sandwiches. <sighs> that limits it so very much. Because I got, I got a couple very interesting Africa meals that weren't sandwiches just down the road from where you were, and they they stand out. So I, I don't know. I got to think more about sandwich. Maybe the, the most interesting meal I've ever had is the one where I was way, way, way back in the sticks. I mean, out there in the, the back end of Equatorial Guinea or maybe into Cameroon. I, I think the river marks the boundary, and we were on the Equatorial Guinea side of the river, so we must have been there. And we went to a village with no electricity. It wasn't that the plant was out. I mean, it's just mud huts. That's just all there is to it. And we were there to do some language work. And I had held myself out as a Spanish speaker, and they speak Spanish in Equatorial Guinea. Do they really? But not the kind of Spanish I spoke. <laughs> so we went, and like people paid for me to go, and we got there. I'm like, all right, I'm ready. Wait, what? Uh, otra vez? Wait. Uh, lo siento. Una más. Uh, uh. Okay, I don't speak this kind of Spanish, guys. You want me to just go home? What do you want me to do? I don't. I don't know. I thought it would just be a lot of ths on the s's, but it's it's no, it's a whole other thing. I'm a poser. Uh, this is terrible. I'm so sorry. I'll get you all a refund. So we're back in this place. I can kind of communicate with folks. Their native language is, is a, a tribal language, but there's kind of a pidgin Spanish. I don't know if you call it pigeon when it's half Spanish. Maybe that's only if it's half English. What was the tribal language? Is it Quechua or uh, I? I, Wait, Equatorial Guinea. Where, I knew once. Where is that? Uh, it is right in the T-Rex's chin and neck, like right where it goes from chin down to neck in the T-Rex of Africa. They speak Spanish there? It's the only Spanish colony in Africa. Yeah. Really? Yeah, very curious. It's strange. Okay. Yeah, I remember the, the people group we were there to interact with, but I don't know if their language is the same as the name of the people group. Whatever the case. We were well-received. I mean, we went way back in there, dude. And on the way, I will never forget, we're cruising along, bumping down this impossible road, sweltering hot, deep jungle, and we see this guy walking along the road, and he, I, I've told you this before, he had a monkey backpack. But it was a monkey. But it was a monkey. <laughs> it wasn't like... Like a dead monkey. It, yeah. It wasn't like my kids where it's a stuffed monkey and it's adorable. No, that was just like a straight-up dead monkey with the eyeballs out. <laughs> like, and they just they just took all the stuff out of the chest cavity, and that's where you could put like your lunch. It makes you sense. Could just store it in there. It does make sense. It does. <laughs> just the limbs were broken so they could be tied together for the straps. <laughs> the tails swinging down. Below. That would work. <laughs> oh gosh. What's weird about that? That would I work. I mean, it's a hollowed out monkey backpack. <laughs> I guess that I feel like it speaks for itself. So we, we get all the way back in there. Everybody's super friendly, excited to have us there. I'm catching some of it. Fortunately, we had other talented people who joined with us, and they were great. They could speak the language. They bailed me out. But they made dinner for us right about as it was getting dark, and as the whole village came to watch us eat. They didn't eat with us. They watched us eat. Oh, wow. And I remember that that was the first time I'd ever had yuca, the yeah. mashed up. It, a little bit, it's like a potato, yuca. but a little fibrous. Yeah, like a plantain slash potato. Yes. A little bit gummier. Yep. And it was fine. Absolutely fine. And I had determined, I'm, whatever you put in front of me, yum. I'm eating it I'm all. I'm eating it all. Right. Mm -hmm. More please. So we're in there. It's dark, and people had a couple flashlights. So they break out a couple of flashlights. There's just some villagers were holding and pointing at us while we ate. <laughs> and so it was pretty uncomfortable. And you know, we're all eating and like, yeah, yeah, that was very good. Well, the lights drew in these huge jungle moths. Yeah. And somebody who's overzealous gets a, a little handmade bush broom and starts swinging it around, trying to get the moth to get out of our meal. Like, I'm going to get that moth. And they knocked it clean into my mouth. Like mid bite, they knocked that, that moth into my mouth and I crunched it. I mean, I didn't like bite all the way through it and eat it. I, I, I spit the thing and 
I, I ingested some of it, surely, but it was just like this dust cloud of bug crunch in yeah. my mouth. Scales, yeah. And I still had to finish that meal. Yeah, you did. <laughs> How'd you do? I finished that meal. Was it, so is yucca or yucca? How do you say that? I, I thought it was yucca. But yucca, yeah. And know. what else? Not much more. Really? Yeah, I, I don't remember what else. That's awesome. Um, Maybe some little fish from the river or something? I, I don't remember. It's been a while now. But I remember that that moth went in my mouth, and it was big. We're not talking like a miller. We're talking like big. A lunar moth, like a big one. It was massive. And somebody came over and gave me like the, you got you got something on, you got some. Oh, that's a moth. You got some moth on the side of your face from where it turned back into dust. You might want to. <laughs> like, except it's you know cross cultural <laughs> cross language. <laughs> my hosts are telling me to dust the moth off of my face. So, so when we get back from the break, I want to share another interesting thing about sandwiches with you. Please do. This episode of Notum Questions is brought to you by Audible. We've been talking about stories a lot lately. Like two of the last four episodes, it feels like we've done like the deep dive into the story thing, and now here you are telling me a very long and well-spun story that I'm excited to get back to. What stories have you been consuming lately? Well, a lot. Um, I just started a new book, but but the one, if we're talking about Audible here... We are. ...and we're recommending books, then I'd like to throw out The Apollo Murders by Chris Hadfield. Uh, I mentioned that in a previous episode. Indeed, you tried to sell me on it. Yeah, yeah. So you did a good job. Are we going to do that? You gonna you think you're going to listen to it? Yeah, I'm going to listen to it. I'm in. Okay. Sounds good. What what are you doing? I am re-listening to a book that I first encountered in print, but I'm really enjoying in the audio format called Il Nome Della Rosa. In it's, Espanol? Uh, it's Italian. Oh. It's by a guy named Umberto Eco. Pretty famous book written in 1980, but it, I'm not good enough at Italian to listen to it in Italian. I just want to try oh. to sound cool. <laughs> I'm listening to it in English. Okay. Uh, it's about high drama like murder mystery thriller set in the 14th century in a monastery Ooh, that sounds cool that sounds like history story monastery all things you like uh yes and with like kind of ties to the future and looking back say the name again the name of the rose il nome de la rosa el nome de la rosa il yeah Mm -hmm. il il nome de la rosa il nome de la rosa Oh, that's awesome! I'm sorry, you were telling me what's it about again? It's it's just I mean it's a it's a thriller. Yeah, it's not at all like some kind of drab history slog where you learn about monks, which sounds really boring on the surface, monks. But it's one of the most interesting aspects of the Middle Ages is this entire learned culture with their own secret rites and rituals and their own pressures within. And these are still humans that go to monasteries. Monasteries are motivated by different things. I mean, there were monasteries that were founded because people felt guilty they murdered somebody. And so they started a whole new religious order to try to serve as penance for what they got wrong. There's drama behind these kind of things, but there's also nobility behind it. Also, this is where the knowledge hides and lives. This is where the preservation of... Aristotle and Plato and all the stuff we talked about last time around lives and is being copied and... Like physically copied, like written out. Yeah. Like scri- scribes. Scriptoriums, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so this is a historical fiction work that will take you back into that world and you will learn a ton about a slice of life that you've only seen caricatures of in silly blockbusters and goofy cartoons this will get you into that world of what it was like, what the rhythm of life was like, and how interesting it would have been to be a part of that life that from the outside looking in might seem really boring. This is so crazy, man, because the book I'm sitting here telling you about, The Apollo Murders, it's a history about the stuff I like, which is science and technology and the space program, and it's a thriller. And then you've got the same thing going on from the humanities perspective. It's a historical thriller, right? Okay, you kind of stole my thing right there. The whole idea, as I'm sitting here like, oh, well, what book do I want to recommend? I know you're working on putting something together where we actually talk with Chris Hadfield, if we can make it happen, about the Apollo murders. And it's in your wheelhouse, and it's your subject matter, but it's historical fiction, and it takes you into intrigue and thriller stuff. And I was like, oh, I can match that. I got one like that that you might like, too. So, yeah, you caught me. That's... uh, 
that's exactly what brought this one to mind. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Well, let's uh, let's do it. So if you want to be in on these books, go to audible.com slash NDQ, or you can text NDQ for Notum Questions to 500 500 and new members get to try it for free for 30 days. And so you can use your Audible credits to get uh, The Apollo Murders by Chris Hadfield, right? Your Audible, well, or you could get uh, Umberto Echoes, The Name of the Rose. Okay. Or you could get both. Yeah. Because every month you get another credit. Oh, yeah. And so you just work through one one month, and then you could work through Destin's right after you work through mine the next month. So audiobooks are the way. Like, it's the yes. way to consume stuff to get knowledge in your mind to transport yourself to another place and you know effectively eat a sandwich in Farafini, the gambia <laughs> with yes. someone else that's had yes. that common experience so i i think it's going to be amazing if you uh if you do that because it's, it's going to help your life i i love telling people about audible because it's changed so much for me very much agree so if you want to try out Audible, you can go to audible.com slash NDQ, use the promo code NDQ, that gets you that free 30 days, or you can just text NDQ to 500-500, that'll have the same effect, plus it gives you access to the, the whole Plus catalog, all of the additional library material beyond your one credit a month. Awesome. Thanks so much to Audible for making our lives better and for supporting the program, and thank you to all of you in the third chair who support the sponsors. That makes this thing go. <laughs> Okay, so I've asked you about your favorite sandwich. You still haven't answered that, by the way. Well, okay, I was going to go with just this sandwich that I invented at a local deli in Grand Island. We even made up a name for it because yes. all of their sandwiches now were... we're talking. Uh, all their sandwiches were named after train things. Okay. And I was like, ooh, I got some train names that you haven't used up yet. <laughs> some of them are offensive, but I'll think of one that isn't. <laughs> and I all I wanted was just a barbecue chicken... I don't know what kind of cheese that was, but it was real good. And it was on like that focaccia bread. It's kind of got the ridges. You know what I'm talking about? I think so. Yeah. It's, and so they would toast that thing up for me. I don't know why that wasn't on the menu to start with, but they started making it for me. And I kept asking, like I would just butcher something that's already up there. Like, uh, yeah, I want the, uh, I want the caboose, but... Minus this, 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 and this, plus this, 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 and this, and then extra toasted. And finally, after four or five times, they're like, we just need to come up with a name. I'm like, yeah, call it the the break house or the uh, express line or I, I can't remember what we called it. Yeah. And then I would go in every time and then eventually, boom, there it is on the menu. And so it was there last time I went back and checked. There's a, there's a local place, uh, a little deli called The Brick. Okay. And they're known for their sandwiches at lunch. Mm-hmm. And I usually go in and I, I get a, you know, pick a sandwich and get like half sandwich, half soup. That's my thing. Okay. And so I sit in the same section every time I go. And I'm in there alone one day. Or No, no, I, I'm with George, actually. We're, we're sitting there, we're talking, and uh, we go to order. And the waiter, who's, whose name is Brandon, he's like, uh, yeah, what do you want? I was like, man, do you, do you have any odd you or any you know, whatever you call it, the dipping sauce, like the French dippy sauce. I was like, I'm sitting here looking at this Philly. It's called Casey's Philly. Mm -hmm. I want that, but I want to dip it in something. Do you have anything I could dip it in? He's like, dude, right? He's like, man, I, I've been telling them they need to do that because that'd be awesome. But no, we don't have anything. Dude, I'm going to, I don't know. I don't have it today, but we'll, we'll figure it out. I was like, I like okay. like your Brandon voice. Yeah, Brandon's cool. He's like, all right, whatever. So I'll just get this and I'll order something else. All right. Fast forward a month, I go in alone with a laptop, and I got to you know do some just paperwork stuff. And so I'm sitting down, Brandon, I'm not in his section, he points at me, he's like, hey, I got you. I was like, what? He's like, come over here, sit in my section. And so I, I went over and I said, he, he said, I'll be right back, let me show you something. He walks back to the kitchen, he's a waiter, remind you. He walks back to the kitchen, he comes back, he puts a jug, it looks like a little maple syrup jug, on the table, and he said... Dude, check this out. It's a little jug of aju. Aju? How do you say it? I think aju. I think that's right. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know what it is. The I know what you the mean, The dippy though. stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's like, check this out. Got it at the grocery store for us. Like, the implication- He went to the grocery store to buy aju? Yes. Because you wanted some once, and he thought you might come back someday? Yes. And a month later, he had it in the fridge- <sighs> He pulled it out. I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, dog, I'm serious. I was like, dude, 
you know what my order is. Casey Philly, the whole sandwich. No half and half today, buddy. He's like, that's right. He goes back. He brings out a cup of au jus. He has, he's warmed it up. He microwaved it or whatever he did. Dude, it was amazing. So anyway, long story short, after talking with him, turns out he's a semi-professional wrestler, and we're totally going to have him on sometime. What now? Yeah. That- <laughs> he's a semi-professional wrestler called The Locksmith. Which is a <laughs> that's gr- his name. Which is a great semi-professional name. Oh, what's he's his a, move? Uh, I'm, I imagine he locks people. I don't know, but he's going to come on and talk to us about it. Oh golly, he does a circuit, dude. I bet it's the lock picker. Ooh, no, I don't like the visual image of that. No, no, as he, a wrestling he locks move. people up, dude. Like so, he's oh. got like arm locks and stuff. Anyway, we're gonna have him on. But that let's get back to the sandwich. Okay, that sandwich, dude, dude, incredible sandwich. It was really, really good. So anyway. Sandwiches mean things. Like, <laughs> so the point is, <laughs> sandwiches mean things. Wait, what? <laughs> what? This is not stupid. <laughs> this is not stupid. I was not suggesting it was stupid. It's just an amazing, but the point is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let, so let me read you Africa, an- Sierra Leone, egg, pro wrestler, Aju. Sandwiches mean something. Yes. How do sandwiches mean something? It, it just does. I mean, like the experience of eat. I don't know. It's just for me. It matters. Okay, I'm going to read you an email I received okay. a while back. Okay. For a moment, we're going to set aside the argument or the discussion as to whether a hot dog is a sandwich or not. Oh. Real quick, though, where are you on that? Is a hot dog a sandwich? No. Okay. I'm okay with whatever your answer is there. I don't really care. You know, hot dogs are great. But check this out. Okay. A while back, this was 2016. Okay. I forget how I was I was having a conversation with a friend and it came up that Tara and I were going to take an honest to goodness uh vacation for our anniversary which we had never done to this level. You went somewhere awesome. <clears throat> Amazing. We went to Iceland. And in casual conversation I was talking to it was a uh, do you know John Green? Sure, yeah. Yeah, John, you know, the great author He's Anthropocene reviewed. Great dude. Mm-hmm. I just casually brought up. I was like, dude, we're so excited. I'm going to take Tara to Iceland. And I'm so excited about it. Like, you, you've been, right? And he, he said, yeah, I've been. And I said, do you have any recommendations? He's like, man, it's just a great country. And he's telling me all about it. <clears throat> and then, wherever we were, I forget. might have been VidCon. Who knows? Go home. Forget all about it. Out of the blue, get an email from John Green. And I would like to read it to you. Okay. Because I think about this email often, like a lot. It says, subject line, from John Green to Destin, quick recommendation. Okay. Okay. So I went to Iceland Iceland in 2008. 2008, And I remember it being being fun and a great experience. And I think you guys will have an amazing time. I have one recommendation. I highly recommend you go to this one hot dog stand which I will not attempt to spell in Icelandic. 70% of Iceland's residents have eaten there at least once. It is the best hot dog I have ever eaten by a wide margin, and I think about it often. I don't even know why it was so good. Maybe it isn't so good and won't hold up to my memory, but I remember it as overwhelmingly the best hot dog I have ever eaten. I was able to find this place, by the way, by Googling that one amazing amazing hot dog dog stand stand in in Iceland. Iceland. (laughs) Quote. And then he says some nice things. and He signs it off, John. I just got that email. So now the whole trip to Iceland turns on when can we get to this hot dog stand. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But there's one line. As you probably know, John is an incredible author. He's very good at writing. Yes. The, the way he can turn a phrase is just incredible. He's a good thinker. I just yeah. really like the man. And it happens in person in conversation. Yeah, it's the it's, way he truly is. Yes. Right. I remember the first time I met him, he introduced, it was at a conference for people that make science videos and educational videos on YouTube, and he introduced himself as John. He said something nice, and he said, I'm a writer. And I laughed. I was like, no, nah, John, you are you make videos. What are you talking about? He's like, no, no, really. I'm So he, he identifies as a writer, and he should. He's amazing at it. So um, the sentence that I think about all the time from this email was, it is the best hot dog I have ever eaten by a wide margin, and I think about it often. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's the kind of thing that Civil War soldiers wrote back to their brides in Iowa. Like, Here we face the great tribulation of our time as we prepare to confront the enemy. I think of you and the children often, except it's a hot dog. <laughs> Why are you going into a southern gentleman voice? I don't know. He was from I, Iowa. I don't know. It's how everybody sounded back then. <laughs> so this this concept that, that John introduced to me in that moment, I think about it often. There are specific culinary experiences that I think about often. There's the time I showed up in this little village in Germany after flying all day and all night on my first international trip alone into a place where I did not understand the language. I went to an internet cafe, and I ordered food. I said, what food do you have? And they had a frozen tuna pizza that they put in the microwave for me. Perfect. I, re- I remember that food. I remember the egg sandwich in Fair Finney, the Gambia. I, I remember the time I was handed a bag of rice in the hills of of Ecuador, and I turn the bag over, and there's a chicken foot in it. I remember all these different things, and they matter to me because it's part of my human experience, and like I am internalizing it in a way that nobody else will ever know what that was or what that meant to me, but it was so important, and I can't tell you why. I can tell you the time I was in Honduras. We got a bus stuck. It was so stuck, the the tractor couldn't get it out. We had to go get a guy's ox. Like he had two oxen. He hooked up to the bus and got it out, and I had to drive a truck down the mountain with stick shift. I didn't know how. I can tell you the Coca-Cola I drank at the bottom of the mountain because I was too afraid to drink the water at the top because I had been told about you know all the salmonella I would get or whatever. I don't know why, but when I travel, when I'm somewhere else, if I'm very, very hungry and I'm given that one food, that one thing to eat, it matters to me, and and I think about it often. And uh, that's why I wanted to know what your most memorable sandwich was, because mine had a dollop of five-gallon bucket mayonnaise on it in, in the streets of Farafinney, the Gambia. I think that stuff sticks with you because it's sacramental. You are ingesting and partaking in a place and a memory. Or maybe that's why the sacrament within Christianity is what it is. The idea is you are ingesting the reality of God's redemptive work. Uh, I'm not very good at sacramental language because that's something that more Catholic expressions of Christianity have really targeted the language on. But you took that stuff with you. You made it a part of you. Part of you is still made of that frozen tuna German pizza. Part of me is still made of that moth at some level, in some way. Consuming that is a level of intimacy with a culture and an experience and the product of the land and the economy and the creativity and the whole ancient story of a place, no matter how silly or trite some of those expressions might be or how meaningful and point of pride that particular bit of cuisine might be, it's still part of the story. And it's not something that you look at like the Mona Lisa and go, dang, good art over there behind that rope. Or something that you hike and you're like, great volcano, just nine out of 10, great. And then you move on. You actually ingest this aspect of other people's story, even if it's a silly part of the story. And so I don't think it's weird at all for you to say that those things conjure something for you that is different than other kinds of memories. You look skeptical. No, I'm just I'm just thinking about a lot. I'm thinking about granddaddy when I used to go spend the night with granddaddy when I was young. And at night, right before we'd go to bed, he'd walk in there and he goes, Hey, Destin, you want an ice cream sandwich? I was like, yes, sir, I do. All right, come on in here and let's sit at the table and let's eat an ice cream sandwich. <laughs> and he'd give me a little ice cream sandwich out of the fridge. He always had him there. So I don't know. I just wanted to share that with you as my friend. I wanted to know what you thought about that. And I wanted to know what your most memorable sandwich was. All of this conversation reminds me of the ultra, ultra famous Anthony Bourdain quote. The one that kind of summarizes the guy's whole life. Okay. You know who I'm talking about? I do. He's the, what do you call him? Good An adventure. He, he traveled travel the world TV and host. ate. Yeah. I've got a mental image of him sitting at a table in Vietnam with President Obama, I think it was. There you go. Yeah. Food was the excuse for him. 
Yeah. But also he understood that food tells a story and maybe he wouldn't use the language sacramental, but I bet he wouldn't be appalled by my use of that language. This is his famous quote. Eat at a local restaurant tonight. Get the cream sauce. Have a cold pint at four o'clock in a mostly empty bar. Go somewhere you've never been. Listen to someone you think you may have nothing in common with. Order the steak rare. Eat an oyster. Have a Negroni. Have two. Be open to a world where you may not understand or agree with the person next to you, but have a drink with them anyways. Eat slowly. Tip your server. Check in on your friends. Check in on yourself. Enjoy the ride. <laughs>